the Akbar, the great Mughal ruler Akbar, creates a great age of painting, and it is particularly focused on storytelling. It starts with his own story, Akbar Nama, because if you're a great ruler and you love painting and you love storytelling painting, why not start with the story of you, the history of Akbar, written by Abul Fazl, his very brilliant biographer and advisor. He's such an interesting character. He, I, I, I'm being playful and, and teasing him. You know I love to tease Akbar because I love him and I think he's amazing. Um, he's actually incredibly enlightened as a ruler. Not only does he commission stories about himself and numerous other stories, he commissions the first great, excuse me, the first illustrated Ramayana, the great Hindu epic poem, the idea of painting it, painting it out in pictures, starts with Akbar. So he's an inspiring figure because his great political success was absolutely tied to his, his conscious policy of fostering cosmopolitan tolerance and pluralism. He was a man of great intellectual curiosity. He was not fixated on rigid orthodoxies. So he consciously broke the Islamic theocrat's power. And he defied the expectations and conventions around an iconic imagery that was part of Islamic tradition. He actually created what he called his house of worship that was opened to Jains, Hindus, Christians, and invited them all to discuss their views. In addition to commissioning the first illustrated Ramayana, he promoted a syncretic ethical code based on multiple religions. He eliminated punitive taxes on non-Muslims. He married a Hindu princess. Now this was certainly, you know, political and this, you know, women in this time and place had very little autonomy, no autonomy, very little agency over their own bodies and choices. But nevertheless, the idea, he did respect her religious preferences. There was no forcing her to convert. And his throne room actually has many symbols that predate Islam, including this axis mundi. Um, and then it has sort of the four channels symbolizing the Islamic concept of the four part garden of paradise. He collected Christian art, Dutch landscapes, Flemish paintings. He was interested in the world and he inspired his artists to mix and merge traditions from Persia, from India and from Europe. So the Mughal style of painting is partly made out of Persian painting tradition. That's one of its threads. So here we're looking at an example of the Persian painting tradition depicting the Feast of Sada. And what you can see is that it is delightfully non-naturalistic. It is full of lines and colors that indicate objects. We can clearly see this is a human figure sitting on a carpet. We can clearly see the rocks and the flowers, but none of these are trying to look like things that at the way things really look in real life. These rocks are bright pink and purple to be artistic, to be flamboyantly gorgeous. And the figures are flattened. They are not supposed to seem as if they are, are going to fool your eye that they're real figures with muscles and bones because these are stylized figures. Let's look at that term stylization and how we use it in art history. We use it as the opposite of naturalism. And to illustrate these two poles of artistic possibility, I'm contrasting this stylized image of Hello Kitty <laughs> created by the Sanrio Corporation in 1974 with this painting of a cat, right? So two cats, this one called Cat, Oide Toko, a Japanese artist, 1841 to 1905. And this is highly naturalistic. 
because you feel as if you are seeing an actual cat. You can feel like you can touch the fur of the ears. The anatomy is incredibly defined and believable from the kind of hunched shoulders to the paw to the whiskers, the way the eyes are looking at the insect, which is also incredibly naturalistic. So there's a use of shading, right? The shading from light to dark on the fur. So not just the color of the fur as being variegated, but the fact that we feel like the actual, um, the paint itself has gets slightly darker to create a contour in three-dimensional space. We feel as if this cat is behind the screen door in three-dimensional space that this is behind, this is in front of, and the cat is sort of curving around toward the insect. In contrast, Hello Kitty is absolutely flat as can be. She is cut out shapes. She also has no feet and no hands, no paws. She is completely stylized because she's not supposed to look like the real thing. This is not it, the Sanrio Corporation, it's not as if they've tried to make it look realistic and have failed. It's that Hello Kitty is a kind of a fantasy creature. You could almost say the spirit or the essence of girlish kitty cuteness. She's really supposed to convey the abstract idea of cuteness more than any particular cat by not being three-dimensional, by not having shading. She doesn't seem to actually reside in time. She doesn't get older. She's as young as she was in 1974. She is all crisp and clean, crisp and clean shapes and colors. She is aestheticized. And the figures in the Feast of Sada are like that. We can recognize them as human figures, just as we did Hello Kitty. We know she's a kitty, but like Hello Kitty, they're flat shapes because they are distilled essences. We could say that they are ornamental. They've been ornamentalized and they have a calligraphic quality. The highest art form in the Islamic tradition is calligraphy, beautiful writing. And there's a quality of calligraphic ornamental beauty throughout all of the figures and the forms, the objects, the plants. Some pages in the Akbar Nama really have that sense of dense ornamentation, which is really very, a, a favorite aspect of the Islamic artistic tradition. They have that highly stylized feeling, such as this one, which depicts a battle, right? So it's quite amazing that everything is so packed in there in terms of pattern and ornament that you almost can't tell what's going on, which is appropriate for the chaos of a battle. But I also want you to see how everything is also so stylized. So the strokes that indicate the terrain, they are also kind of patterned in their repetition. And all of the figures are patterned and the, the elephants even wear these amazing patterned ornamental gar garments, you could say. Kbar also loved the naturalism of the South Asian painting tradition. We didn't see a lot of it because not a lot survives, but we saw this bodhisattva briefly from the Ajanta caves. It's rather deteriorated. It's hard to tell, but we can see better if we go to this painted wall in Sri Lanka. We can see the naturalism of this apsara, this celestial being, how her arm seems to be really three-dimensional because of the shading from light to dark, the sense of modeling, right? of the three-dimensional form of the shoulder and the arm in space. The sense that her body is not flat, but seems to have um, a turning, a contour that indicates her three-dimensionality. Three Bar was also very interested in the European art that Dutch and British traders brought. And so he even had his artists copy them outright because he was so curious about the techniques of illusionism, of three-dimensional naturalism that European painters had been perfecting around 1500. 